Good morning and afternoon, everyone. My name is Aaron Gorell, and thank you for participating in today's 218th Justice Clearinghouse webinar, during which experts from the Milwaukee, Glendale, and Orlando Police Departments are here to discuss overlaying digital intelligence and ballistics, ballistics technology to enhance investigations. You know, today's investigations into violent crimes, especially gun-related crimes, have becoming more, become more time-consuming due to factors including increases in the sources and quantities of digital and ballistics evidence. These new investigative challenges are stretching both small and large departments alike, and to solve these increasingly complex cases, law enforcement agencies are overlaying innovative technologies that help investigators gather and analyze both physical and digital evidence more efficiently and effectively. This webinar has been brought to you by a number of great technology leaders who are all committed to keeping our community safe. Our first sponsor is Alter Electronics Forensic Technology, who provides innovative and effective solutions like its unique technology, IBIS, that helps find that needle in the haystack by discovering matches between spent, pair, uh, spent bullets and cases at speeds well beyond human capacity. And our second sponsor is Celebrite, and as the global leader in digital intelligence, Celebrite supports the entire investigative team, from forensic examiners and analysts to investigators and first responders in the field with industry-proven range of solutions for digital forensics, triage, and analytics. And last, but certainly not least, ShotSpotter is used by more than 90 cities and is the leader in gunfire detection, location, and forensic analysis for police departments and campus security personnel. Now we do have three speakers, including Shannon Kale of the Milwaukee Police Department, Trevor Good of the Glendale, Arizona Police Department, and Ed Michael of the Orlando Police Department. Shannon has been a crime analyst in the Milwaukee Police Department's Fusion Center for four years, and her role consists of criminal case investigations and tactical analytical support. Detective Trevor Good has been with the Glendale Police Department for 13 years and is currently assigned to the Gun Violence Violent Crime Squad. He routinely utilizes multiple technologies in developing his gun crime investigations. And lastly, we have Ed Michaels. And Ed is a detective and digital forensics examiner with the Orlando, Florida Police Department. He has been involved with digital forensic investigations and research for eight years and has consulted on cases around the world, including the Boston Marathon bombing, political party hacking, and terrorism incidents. And now very briefly, before we begin, I'd like to share with you some information about the Justice Clearinghouse. The Clearinghouse is the only peer-to-peer -peer educational program for justice professionals that emphasizes the multidisciplinary nature of an effective justice system. Through our year-round virtual conference, our audience and subscribers begin to develop a comprehensive understanding of the justice system while breaking down many of the misconceptions that plague our systems. While live events are free to attend, subscribers do receive 7x24 access to recorded webinars and are eligible to receive certificates of attendance. If you're not presently a subscriber, I'd invite you to join today and support the work that we're doing here. So the last three things I'd like to address with everyone is some basic housekeeping items. First, the event is being recorded and scheduled to last about 60 minutes. Second, this is a listen-only event, but you can type in any questions you have through the GoToWebinar toolbar, and we'll take as many as possible at the conclusion of the formal presentation. Third, our sponsors have made the presentation materials available for download under the GoToWebinar toolbar, and if you look under Handouts, you should see the PDF there. And finally, after today's webinar, there will be a follow-up survey, and we ask that you complete it. Your feedback helps us shape our future schedule of events. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Jim, it's all yours. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, hello to everyone, and thank you for joining us. Today, we're going to discuss how to enhance crime gun investigations by overlaying technologies. When used properly, technology maximizes uh, an investigator's ability to not only solve more cases, but just as importantly, prevent crime. In every region across the, the U.S., we see a large percentage of shootings being committed by a small percentage of the criminals. This is why it is important to get the shooters identified off the streets before they recommit. Technology allows for investigators to accomplish this much faster and with more efficiency. 
giving them the ability to share information across jurisdictional borders, to link crimes that would not otherwise have been linked, uh, thus generating additional leads for investigators, and to give prosecutors evidence to corroborate witness testimony. Next slide, please. You see here a list of just some of the technologies that can assist you. Certainly, this is not an all-inclusive list. Uh, it's important for you to know that technologies are available not only through your agency, but in your region and how you can use these technologies. Now you're going to hear about investigations where intelligence derived from multiple technologies was used to solve crimes. Our first presenter is Shannon Kale from the Milwaukee Police Department. Shannon? Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. I want to just give a brief understanding of our NIBIN program in Milwaukee. Uh, we implemented the NIBIN program within, within the police department in late fall of 2013. Our first NIBIN lead generated was in November 2013, which helped match a ballistics evidence found at a 2010 homicide to a 2013 shooting. So right away, we have seen success with this technology. But it wasn't until January of 2014 when we were able to leverage multiple technologies along with the NIBIN technology to have our first biggest success. Next slide, please. So if you notice from this map, um, we were seeing an increase of firearm-related incidents scattered throughout one of our districts. This is District 3. From November 2013 to February 2014, we saw 175 incidents involving firearm-related crimes. And in these two months, um, we were getting questions from our command staff. How do we deploy to this area? What are the patterns that we're seeing? What's connected? What do we even do to intervene or be proactive in this case? So one of the things that we said, well, what other type of technology do we have on top of our rec recorded crime that we can overlay with us to give us a better understanding about this location? Next slide, please. So we also have ShotSpotter at this time. And within a two month, the same two month range and in this area, we had 46 ShotSpotter alerts. So that tells us that not only was there firearm crime at these incidents, but someone discharged a firearm. So that gave us an opportunity to go to those areas to collect the ballistic evidence to be placed into the NIBIN machine. So what did we find? Next slide, please. What we were able to find were nine incidents connected together through ballistic evidence. There were three armed robberies, one of them that turned into a non-fatal shooting, four shot spotter alerts, and two shots fired into a home. What this does for us is this gives us an opportunity and a starting point to help focus our police department resources in an area in hopes to solve this case. Next slide, please. So after doing law enforcement strategy and reading through all the incidents and developing an MO and coming up with a plan of action, we were able to send our detectives and our officers in that uh, four by eight block radius. And in February of 2014, we received a call that there was an armed robbery in progress. Those detectives and officers that were deployed to that area regarding the Niven case were able to respond immediately. They talked to the victims and were able to obtain suspect descriptions and vehicle descriptions, where then within 10 minutes, they were able to apprehend one adult and two juveniles. Within that vehicle, they were able to recover a firearm and a victim's cell phone from a previous armed robbery. That cell phone was sent to our technology unit, where they were able to use Cellbrite to download the media on that phone. What they found were two videos that were very incriminating, showing our suspects sitting at a table with the firearm, as you can see in the blue box, sitting next to it. This helped give additional layers of information regarding this case in hopes to get better charges on these individuals. Next slide, please. 
Sometimes it's really good to have a visualization to understand all the technologies together in a timeline. So we were able to create this timeline that shows shot spotter along with the ballistic matches and then the individuals that were apprehended at the end. These timelines are very helpful products to aid in investigations during interviews and QPs. We've also seen them to be helpful for the district attorneys that don't really understand the NIBIN program. And when it's all laid out, it kind of brings to light certain things that they might not have seen just reading through reports. Next slide, please. So bad news is the juveniles were not charged regarding this case. At the time, they were 14 and 15 years old. However, the adult was charged for felon in possession of firearm and was sentenced to six years in prison. Along with that, the firearm recovered in the vehicle did match to Nibin case 312, closing it out and no longer causing harm in our community. Next slide. This is my contact information. I work 8 to 4 p.m. Central Standard Time, Monday through Friday. You can call me or email me if you want to know more about the Milwaukee NIBIN program or if you just want to come out and visit and see how we do things up here. Um, this concludes my portion of the briefing. I want to thank you for listening, and I'm going to pass it off to Trevor. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Detective Trevor Good with the Glendale Police Department. I'm going to present a case um, that I worked on that's going to kind of tie in all of these technologies. Uh, obviously, I don't know who's in the audience and what your your backgrounds are, but what it will show is that the technology doesn't replace a good investigation, but it ties the investigation together so officers and detectives can, can move forward and be successful. Next. So obviously, as you guys can see on the screen, in 2015, we had a shooting um, that happened in a known gang neighborhood in the city of Glendale. So the case started three years ago, but didn't really get solved until about two months ago, having tying all these technologies together to, to bring stuff forward. So the other thing that was an, an issue with this case is that the detective who was working it left the organization. So I kind of picked this up. Um, about nine months ago and started re-going over all the evidence that, that was already there. When patrol officers responded to this scene, they knew that we had a shooting there because shot spotter had gone off and let dispatch know that there were seven shots fired in this area. So when patrol shows up, they show up to a massive party where there's multiple known gang members, but there's no physical evidence of a shooting uh, anywhere um, when they showed up. Next slide. So the problems with this case from the get-go is as patrol showed up, they didn't have a victim. He was shot in a car. And at the time, nobody knew that. And that the witnesses and the people who were out there had actually gone up and picked up every single shell casing in the roadway. Their problem with that is through technology, through ShotSpotter, we knew we had shots fired in the area. Well, a short time later, the victim showed up at a local hospital and had uh, four gunshot wounds, one in the head, uh, one in the neck, and a couple in the arm. Uh, he was known to police. He was known to be a high-ranking uh, gang member. And at the time, we didn't know the suspect, um, who the suspect was. However, the suspect was released from prison the day before and had a GPS monitor on his ankle. So one of the detectives that knew of the suspect called into parole, got his GPS coordinates, which put him at the area of the shooting at the time that shot spotter went off. So now we're starting to have a little bit more because we had a victim at a hospital who we believed was going to die at the time due to the headshot wound. Um, no, we have a shooting because shot spotter indicated we had a shooting, even though nobody on scene would really give us any information. Uh, next slide. So the initial, the initial crime scene, even though it was really tampered with, there are things that we did have and that we could use. So obviously, as you guys can see in the slide, the victim showed up, which I said. Uh, the car that the victim was shot in was actually the car that he, he came to the hospital in. So through a shooting reconstruction, we could show the directionality of the bullets that were coming into the victim in the car, not necessarily where it was, obviously, because the car moved. But we could 
we knew that the shooter was outside of the car shooting into the car. Uh, as I said before, that we that was learned that night, the suspect had a GPS monitor on him, so we could put him in the place that the shot spotter activated within, I think, about 30 meters of where they pinged off of each other. And then very shortly after the shooting, the suspect cut off the bracelet for his monitor. Next slide. This is the actual shot spotter uh, report that I printed up and added to um, the report. So th those of you guys who don't have ShotSpotter or aren't using the technology, this is the uh, actual report that is generated from um, the technology that we use and, and submit to prosecutors. So it gives you the exact date and time. It gives you the number of shots. It gives you the GPS coordinates. Um, so even though we didn't have the casings, I can still show that a gun was fired there. And also, if it was a revolver that was fired, we wouldn't have shell casings anyway. So the technology really worked out in this case for us, and it's worked out in several other cases for us. Next slide. So in the meantime, our victim's not super cooperative. He's related to the suspect. This is ultimately our suspect's a high-ranking Mexican mafia member. And this is over a dispute over basically um, turf for a narcotics trade. But the suspect at the time is the only marked or made Mexican mafia member in the state of Arizona that was outside of custody. So his job being outside of custody is to make money for the Mexican mafia. So these are surveillance photos from two separate bank robberies that he did um, while he's out. The one on the left happened in 2017, December 1st of 2017, and the one on the right was just a couple of weeks before that. So even though this initial shooting happened in 2015, this guy is now committing serious violent crimes throughout the valley uh, during this whole whole time that he's free because we could never tie him back to that shooting or the detective that had the case didn't tie him back to that shooting at the time uh, that he was working the case. Next slide. So the, the crimes that I now know that he did in between that shooting and the time that I start working the case are six bank robberies that are all takedown bank robberies that he did with uh, one or two other subjects where they would enter the bank, fire a shot off, and then have everybody get down on the ground and and, and rob the bank. So this these weren't nonviolent offenders who were walking into banks and handing notes. These guys were going in, firing a gun off every single time. And in a couple cases, we got lucky and they left shell casings behind, which is how we got them. Uh, linked up to these crimes via Nibin. Also, there was three known homicides, uh, and all three of those are still ongoing, so I won't give you guys too much information, but they're all gang-related uh, homicides that Nibin tied back to this suspect and another one. Next slide. So back to that 2015 shooting. Um, he's suspected of it, but we can't prove it. But what they did do was violate his parole or have parole uh, pull his number for cutting off his GPS monitor. Undercover detectives from the Glendale Police Department locate him, start surveillance, and ultimately execute a search warrant on his apartment. Inside of that apartment, there's multiple guns located to include uh, an AK-47, a revolver, and a 9mm pistol. While this suspect's DNA is found on that 9mm pistol, we take that gun and test fire it and put it, put the casing into Nibin. That casing correlates back to some of the bank robbery cases. So now we know that that gun is the gun used in some of the takedown style bank robberies. Next slide. And again, because I don't know who's in the audience, um, basically what Nibin is, is when a gun's made or manufactured uh, in that process, there are tool marks left onto the gun. When the gun is fired, those markings are transferred to the bullets, are transferred to the casings, and that's what we're putting into Nibin. Nibin takes uh, photographs and we're able to correlate those between crimes. So that that's kind of the biggest thing for me is, obviously we had his DNA on the gun. Uh, we had the shot spotter putting him, putting out the fact that we know we have a shooting and his GPS monitoring, putting him there. 
but the Nibin results are really what tied it to me because now he has a gun that was used in bank robberies in his possession. So again, it's, it's technology. You can't get away from police work. So I kind of had to start from the beginning, started uh, by interviewing the victim, went out to some other informants and in, in different uh, prison yards. Then I make a call to a prosecutor to kind of let him know what I've uncovered and just present the case before I send it down or before I make an arrest. Well, once I did that, I learned that there were several other agencies looking into this guy for homicides due to the phone tolls that uh, they had had. So then I get brought to a table along with other uh, organizations from other police departments in the Valley, uh, the FBI, and, and now we're just starting to tie together all of his crimes. So I never wrote GPS on his phone and didn't have uh, the time really, but then later learned that another Valley agency was were taking tolls from his phone. And recent activity um, in 2018 was putting his phone tolls in Glendale where we were getting shot spotter activation. So one of the shot spotter activations we believe was another attempted um, murder attempt. However, we couldn't get any victims to come forward because obviously they missed in the shooting, but we were still able to prove that they were at the, that shooting due to their phone records and because ShotSpotter is putting, putting them there. Next slide. So finally, after we coordinate it, and that's the actual suspect in me in the photo, um, we make some arrests. This guy is by far the most educated criminal that I've ever dealt with in almost 14 years. Uh, he'd done about the same amount of time in the Department of Corrections, so he's very hip to criminal investigations and in how police work. And literally for the first two hours of my interview with him, he spent that time fishing information out of me to just see how educated I was, to see what evidence I had against him, and really wouldn't talk to me until I started showing him everything. And some of the things that I showed was the very first thing that I showed was the shot spotter information that I put on the slide that you guys already saw. And then in front of him, I put his GPS coordinates and told him that I knew he was right there when the shots were fired. Before I started talking about any victim statements, because he was pretty confident that in that gang neighborhood, nobody was going to rat him out. And he was mostly right. I had one person finally uh, give me information. But this is a very long investigation. This was an extremely long interview. Uh, but ultimately, I just started laying things down in front of him. And he realizes that the, the police have overwhelming evidence against him for all these crimes. So now we have a high-ranking Mexican mafia member trying to make deals with us and ends up confessing to all these crimes uh, in, in an attempt to lessen what he's going to get, obviously. Uh, he's still in a whole lot of trouble, but basically he was trying to save himself from the death penalty. Next slide. So just kind of to back it up, he's ultimately back in prison now. He's still feeding us information, um, and it was because of all the, the evidence that we were able to put in front of him. This was uh, This is not the type of criminal that was ever going to confess to anything that he didn't think that he needed to. And ultimately, in the end, we talked off the record. He told us that he ended up confessing to these crimes because he knew that he was done. So really, he had to make a decision of how he wanted his prison life to be. Did he want to go back and continue to live in a slam down yard where he's got no freedoms? Or did he want to try to move over to a world where he could have a little bit more freedom? So all these technologies, really, and I don't know how many of you guys are from Arizona, but Glendale is a suburb of Phoenix. Phoenix is a giant city, and he was absolutely the most prolific criminal we had out probably in Arizona at the time that he was arrested. There, he is murdering people. He is committing takedown-style bank robberies. They are, uh, and, it, and the amount of other robberies they had done, they were in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So these guys aren't hitting small-time um, small crimes. They're getting quite a bit of, quite a bit of money from the crimes that they're committing. So just having all these technologies, I was able to tie uh, him to all these crimes, ultimately got him to talk and opened up some other avenues for us to 
to go after another Mexican, or actually two other Mexican mafia members that were also uh, part of these homicides. So the cell phone tolls were big for us. Shot spotter was definitely initially probably one of the biggest tools because if we get a report of a, sh a shooting show up and there's no casings, no evidence, and everybody on the scene is telling us nothing happened, like any police department, we would most likely leave. But because shot spotter is clearly indicating that we had seven shots right in that area, the patrol officers stuck around, didn't leave, and it paid off because in about 30 minutes after that, we had a victim show up to the hospital. Um, Nibin was absolutely crucial in this investigation because unequivocally it tells us that the gun that we found in his possession during the search warrant was a gun used in the bank robberies. Now there was different guns used for the homicides, but again, Nibin was able to tie uh, those homicides together because uh, he was smart. He's smart enough to get rid of guns, but he doesn't get rid of get rid of them fast enough. So two of the people that we know were murdered were murdered with the same weapon. So all these technologies really came together. Um, it took a lot of police work from a lot of different agencies. This definitely isn't something I did by myself, but uh, it, it tied everything in for a successful prosecution. Next slide. And with that, I will turn it over to Detective Ed Michael. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ed Michael, I'm detective with the Orlando, Florida Police Department. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, more of the back end of the investigations and uh, using digital evidence to kind of fill in um, everything from the small gaps that are needed in your cases all the way up to uh, uh, really using it as a major part of your uh, uh, investigative work. In next slide. Uh, a little bit about me. I've uh, been in law enforcement for over 20 years. I've been doing digital forensics for the past uh, eight years, almost eight and a half now. Um, went to college. My uh, education's in information security and actually network intrusion. Um, and, and like most people, depending on the background of the audience who uh, are into digital forensics now, um, I started when it was mainly computers, and then obviously everything has gone mobile, so that's there, kind of where I've uh, transitioned my uh, uh, education and background. Uh, next slide. So a little bit about Orlando, Florida. We're known for uh, the theme parks. We have Universal and, of course, uh, Disney and SeaWorld, and, and we're close to the beaches on both coasts. Um, but there's quite a bit uh, in our, our nice city here and county, um, the metro area, that really isn't on the Disney tour. Um, we have a fairly uh, decent homicide rate that varies year to year. Um, uh, within the past few years, we've ranked in the top. 25 per capita. Um, I think we've broken, I think we're in the top 12 this year so far. Unfortunately, we just had uh, a few last night. Um, and a lot of the homicides we find uh, are to uh, uh, mid-level and high-level drug activity and low-level gang activity. Um, when you look at digital investigations, when you look at crime as a whole, we talk about gangs. Everybody's heard of MS-13 and Bloods and Crips. Um, and really, a lot of the uh, local gangs that are common in, in, in every city um, tend to get overlooked for the more um, uh, the more well-known one, well known ones. Um, but those low-level gangs are just as capable, if not more capable in a lot of cases, of uh, committing crime, committing homicides, and um, committing acts of violence against the residents. Um, we've had an increase within about the past six years of, uh, of high-level gang activity um, where the, the gang members are kind of branching out from their neighborhoods and actually trying to cover different sections of the city. Um, some of them have worked together um, to form larger gangs. Other times we get the little uh, arguments back and forth that, you know, may start with a fight and end with uh, gunfire. Um, as of uh, last year, there's 77 current documented low-level gangs in Florida. And this mainly what the talk is, the, my talk is going to focus on is, is, is low-level gang activity because that's what every city sees. Um, we could get on here and talk about solving ter uh, fighting terrorists and finding um, child explicit image uh, people and 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 but day in and day out really what it comes down to um, both the same example the cases that were previously discussed um, is 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 violent crime uh, next slide and next slide one more time got ahead of myself there all right, one particular gang that uh, we're going to focus on is called YJB. 
Um, this gang started uh, just a neighborhood gang. It was really three or four guys, uh, five guys that started hanging around together um, in around 20, uh, end of 2013, beginning of 2014. Um, they didn't do anything really special to draw attention, maybe some low-level dope sales, um, an, occasion, uh, an occasional strong-arm robbery, um, maybe a snatch of a wallet or a cell phone. Um, didn't really have any structure. And that's the biggest thing with these low-level gangs. Um, there is no structure. You look at major gangs, Bloods, Crips, MS-13, um, some of the El Salvadorian gangs, they have structure, they have a leader. Um, the case that was just discussed there in Glendale, he was a gang member, he was a gang leader. A lot of these neighborhood gangs, they don't have any structure. It's, it's whatever they decide to get together to do that day. Um, but the gang started out very limited resource. They didn't have access to vehicles unless they stole an occasional vehicle, no access to guns. Um, so again, most of the crimes happened there in the neighborhood. Uh, next slide. Um, a lot of their neighborhood crimes, they started as burglaries, uh, some smog arm robberies. And then one of the uh, burglaries they committed one day uh, had a couple firearms in the house. And it was right about the beginning of 2014. That's really when they upped their game. Um, once they had access to a few firearms, um, the gang had started to grow a little bit. They got a few more uh, members in. Um, they went out and decided to do their first commercial robbery. It was a, a uh, local convenience store there in the in the neighborhood. Um, did the firearm at gunpoint. It was caught on video. Um, and then with two days after that, they went ahead and did their first uh, uh, armed carjacking. Next slide. So let's fast forward to around the end of 2015, uh, middle of 2016. By this time, um, the numbers have grown. Involved in. Um, at that point, we had isolated them to uh, or identified them as suspects in 23 shootings. Um, they had committed 41 robberies, 12 of them being of commercial businesses, um, either uh, stores, uh, uh, local convenience stores, a few cell phone stores. Um, and they could be linked back to 30 either burglaries or armed home invasions if the residents were home. Next slide. Obviously, they were, got more property, more money um, from pawning stuff that they stole and, and, and from victims of the robberies. Um, and they started to come up with a lot more structure and a plan. Um, what they began to do was steal Ford pickups. Um, I'm not sure what was so attractive about the Ford part of it, but the pickup truck um, allowed them to basically blend in for one and load up in the vehicle. Um, and they were pretty easy. They're pretty prevalent in certain places of the county here. Very, very easy to get a hold of. Um, they started uh, burglarizing the pawn shops. They would take the trucks. They would drive them into uh, through the barriers, um, hit those pawn shops for the guns, and they would burn the vehicles. Um, they started branching out. This wasn't just around the metro area here of, uh, of Orlando. Um, they hit. Um, they would go as far north as Jacksonville, um, as far south as uh, Fort Lauderdale, and spent a lot of time out west towards um, the Tampa area. Um, and then once they committed their crimes, they got their guns, whatever it is they were uh, looking for, um, they would come back. We would find the vehicles, uh, the stolen vehicles burned and abandoned um, and uh, would be left with really nothing other than just the, 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 uh, the video. Um, they started doing the cell phone store robberies. Uh, they started hitting the stores to uh, they were just grabbing them off the. Off the uh, display racks. Uh, purpose there was to take those phones and sell them for um, additional cash. To the next slide. So some of the different agencies that were involved at this point because of the level of uh, violence that they had reached and the, the branching out that they had done, um, our gang unit for Orlando Police Department, our robbery detectives, our violent crime detectives. We had two members assigned from Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Uh, FBI Safe Streets got involved. And then obviously we had each uh, affected jurisdiction. Next slide. So one of the key things that uh, they, they looked at, um, our gang unit's very proactive and in, in our old location, they actually sat outside of our, um, our office. I mean, they were very proactive when it came to realizing the value of digital evidence, uh, particularly when it comes to phones and social media. Um, they have undercover accounts. Every single arrest that they did of a suspected gang member, um, especially when that was involved in YJB, they seized the phones, they either got consent or they got warrants on them. Um, they ended up generating uh, UFED reader reports. If you're not familiar with Celebrite um, infrastructure or technology, um, it's basically a report that allows you, uh, without a license, to go through search data that's been prepared for you, um, that's been prepared by uh, uh, an examiner. You can do your own tagging, your own bookmarking, things like that. It makes it easier for you to go through and find that information. It's 
to the next slide. Um, so when it came to social media, um, obviously they had a very heavy Facebook uh, presence. Uh, they used Instagram, YouTube, um, all kinds of videos and some of the different apartment complexes they had branched out to of them going through with guns, um, different videos of them having street parties with their guns out um, and various um, uh, interactions that they did. Um, they were sure to, to document all that. The great thing was all that was captured, um, if not the same day it happened, but usually the next day for I, uh, our, our investigators. Next slide. And now we're faced with the challenges. Um, and the biggest challenge was what we see in, in almost every case today um, is the amount of digital evidence. Um, so way back, we used to get one arrest or maybe one homicide. You'd have uh, one suspect phone and one victim phone. Um, now you end up with a homicide, just one of the ones from last night. Um, we have one deceased person. Um, there's no suspect yet. We have two laptops, four phones, and I think two tablets. Um, and that's just from a, a particular scene. It's not even counting anybody, any witnesses or friends at this point or anybody that may have pertinent information. Um, so what do you do with all that? Well, for this particular case, we ended up with uh, over 59 phones um, or, or devices, um, 71 different social media accounts, 180,000 relevant images. Um, and everybody wanted something different. If you remember that list of other jurisdictions, um, you saw uh, um, the ATF was involved, states, um, and more and more data um, that was found led to more and more arrests, which kind of was a never ending circle. Then we ended up with more phones, and everybody wanted something different from uh, those. Um, and this is kind of what I, uh, next slide. And then if you mention, uh, or if you look, this is kind of what I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, when you start your investigation from a digital forensic standpoint, we as examiners, um, you know, we prepare the data uh, that, uh, best we can. We grab what we think is relevant or we give you all the information. And regardless of who looks at the data, um, you start with one phone and that's exciting. It's cool. And this may be some relevant in here. Um, I'm going to put somebody in jail. I'm going to find my next clue. Um, and then two phones, it's still pretty exciting. But then we get to three to five phones, uh, sometimes a little bit more, and it kind of wears off. And now you've got sometimes multiple different types of reports if you've used different uh, extraction technology tools in different formats. And what do I do with that? Um, if you add in 10 plus phones, the excitement's pretty much has worn off. Then you're definitely, you're, you're overlooking information and evidence that may be relevant because instead of being able to look at the big picture, you're just trying to focus on, is this one piece in here I want or not? Um, you add in things like CDR called detail records. Um, I know um, Trevor said they played a very large part in his investigation. And this isn't even counting throwing, you know, a laptop, a desktop computer, any type of hard drive image. Let's do the next slide. So when it came, came time for uh, prosecution, prosecution, this is what they wanted. Um, this is just a snapshot I took up the Internet. This is some type of Russian uh, gang. And this is what the prosecutors wanted. They wanted a gang leader. Um, we wanted uh, the members under them, and that's who we to go after, and we're to go ahead and work our way down. Um, and that's great. That's that's phenomenal. It worked in that case and a lot of cases. Uh, next slide. Uh, but unfortunately, this is what we had. Um, again, there was no structure to the gang, and typically what we see, there's no leader to go after. There's nobody calling the shots. It may be four guys together. One of them decided to do a cell phone robbery one day. Uh, he's not in charge of the gang. It was just his idea. The next day, it may be four different guys, and they decide to go out and break into a bunch of houses. Um, again, there's no structure. There was no one one uh, person to go after. Next slide. One of the things we did know was that the uh, the photos are really the big thing that linked them together. The exit information, the uh, location information off the photos, communication between the different chat apps, um, and we wanted to be able to ID other members. And of course, GPS data combined from the phone apps and especially the call detail records. Um, remember, I said they branched out quite a bit from, from Orlando to go commit a lot of their crimes. They don't know Tampa or Jacksonville or Fort Lauderdale. They use, just like anyone else, with GPS on their phone um, to navigate. So it was great to get that digital information and say, hey, you wanted to navigate to pawn shops in Tampa the night to were burglarized um, and your uh, GPS call detail records put, put you there as well. Next slide. Um, we'll go down to uh, uh, the UFED reader. I kind of mentioned that before. Um, the great thing about it, again, is once you're, uh, if you have a digital forensics person or if you're in digital forensics, definitely prepare that for your investigators. Give them a little bit of training on it. 
um, allows them to work with multiple copies of the same data. Um, if there's five different people on the case, they get five copies of the same uh, evidence, and they can each look look for and tag and pull relevant information out that they're trying to find. Um, it prevents du duplication of work, and it really helps if you have overlapping agencies um, instead of trying to pass around a bunch of PDF reports or just pass around one single item. Go ahead and uh, do the next slide. Um, one of the things that we that really was a big help for us was uh, Celebrite Analytics technology, uh, particularly the enterprise technology. Um, what this did is it took all those call detail records, cell phones extractions, and it put them all in one place and allowed us to search um, across all those sets of data. Um, I mean, if you think about over 59 phones, it allowed us to find photos that matched using the photo, um, so, so some of the photo identification technology that's already built in. Um, it allowed us to identify faces of people that weren't previously that the photos would have gotten missed. Um, it allowed us to put some of those social media images into it to see if those photos matched any of the ones in any of the phones that we were looking for. Um, and it really was critical in pulling all of that information together. Um, it was great because each agency could log in from the forensic lab standpoint. We could kind of do hands off, gave people instructions, a little bit of training on it. Um, they could log in. They could go through and do their own work, their own tagging. And it was seen across the case. So if one of the gang detectives said, hey, this photo is important. I want the prosecutor to see it. When the prosecutor logged in, they could log in and see, hey, here's this photo. And I see why it's, why it's important with, with some uh, uh, comments on there. The biggest thing, it allowed them to do their own searches. Let's do the next slide. Um, the feedback was immediate. Once all the data got parsed through there, um, we were able to instantly go through and do some, uh, some facial recognition matching um, or some, some face matching type uh, uh, functions. Um, it allowed us to do some uh, filter out of those 180,000 images to prevent going through them. It allowed us to go through and just check ones that contain guns, pictures of money. Um, it really allowed us uh, to filter down the amount of work that, that uh, we had to do and then, and then in turn what the investigators had to do in the uh, background. Next slide. Of course, the messaging is always important. Um, you know, seeing a message in one person's phone and then trying to find the one phone of the 59 extractions that they may have sent that message to uh, is next to impossible. Um, this allowed all their messages to be combined and you really got kind of a running timeline of what was going on. So instead of having two or three phones to look at, hey, let's go hit this pawn shop, you could see there was actually two groups talking, not necessarily amongst themselves, but two separate groups. One was doing burglaries at night, and another one was doing pawn shop robberies. And by combining all that together, it really gave you a nice overhead picture of what each one of the members was doing as they went. Next slide. I had mentioned photos were critical. Um, this is one of the photos taken uh, after execution of a SWAT warrant. Um, the guy was in the vehicle. He was just about to back out uh, when we stopped him. And uh, you could see the vehicle, the, one of the handguns was right there. Um, but it's great because he took that picture and he sent it to a few other people. Um, and in that picture was uh, GPS coordinates, obviously where he was, but then the other people who got that photo, we could turn around and link the communication back to him. So we know that they knew each other. They were sending pictures back and forth. It also allowed us to put people together. If uh, here, here's a photo of me and a gun. Um, I've got, I sent it to two or three of my friends. The EXIF information shows you guys together along with call detail records that night. We know that um, you guys were together for whatever might have been done. Let's do the next slide. Uh, probably one of the most basic functions that it done is, is really one of the most practical, and that's uh, the, uh, uh, the diagram analytics, or an example of the whiteboard here. Um, this is what we were able to give the prosecutor focusing down. Um, one of the things to show and charge under uh, RICO is you have to show a, a criminal enterprise and a conspiracy. Um, and this is one of the things that we use to present both to the prosecutor and the jury to say this is the communication between all of them. Um, this generated fairly quickly after we did the case. In fact, um, within a couple minutes of the gang members, or not gang members, but our gang officers coming in and looking at this, um, they actually identified two more people that they didn't, they had no idea about. Um, their names hadn't popped up just from one of the charts right here, and they were able to go out and identify them through. Uh, so uh, social media. Uh, next slide. And I focused a lot on obviously violent crime because that's kind of the theme of the webinar here. Um, but think about other cases that 
um, if you're in digital forensics that you work or that your lab works or that you're seeing. Um, we try to incorporate some type of analytics in almost every single investigation that involves more than one or two devices. Um, some of the ones we've been most successful with are the heroin overdose cases. Um, we'll take all the heroin overdose victims. Uh, we will put them inside the analytics product and our goal is to try to find a link between them, some type of dealer. Um, so far we've been successful with uh, uh, two. Um, there were two separate human trafficking cases. Um, one was a young lady, she was 16. She was basically uh, dumped at the side of the road by the hospital. It would just would have been listed as an overdose and unattended death. Homicide detective took the extra step, started doing some interviews, kind of find out her and her sister were victims of human trafficking. Um, not one of them went to trial when presented with the digital evidence. Um, we ended up with 19 devices in that. The last one just pled earlier this year and he pled to 15 years. Um, any shootings that you have, and I know uh, we, we, we talked about both these in uh, both Glendale and uh, Milwaukee. Um, we've had an influx of Puerto Rican gang activity, um, honestly, since the hurricane last year. Um, so we've seen an uptick of those. And uh, there's really a lot of information in there that ties between Orlando, back to Puerto Rico, and even down to Miami um, it's, as far as tying all that together. Um, any club shootings, um, and again, any recent cases you have in organized gang uh, activity. So, like, you know, like I said, the big theme of it is how do I get all this digital evidence to view it? And regardless of the uh, the product, having some type of analytic tool is definitely critical to getting that uh, combined in some type of uh, easy format. Next slide. All right. I thank you all for your time and we'll give you back to uh, Jim. Thank you, Ed. Uh, well, we heard from uh, uh, the three agencies, the three presentations, uh, three commonalities in each of those pre in each of those presentations. We had firearms, we had phones, uh, the media uh, uh, media outlets such as computers, tablets, getting not only the phone numbers, the the call detail records, but also the images. And the third commonality was there was multi jurisdictions were involved. All, all of these investigations and all these criminals, these crime crime gun cases, very rarely will it be one in one uh, jurisdiction uh, where these crimes are, are committed. Criminals uh, don't know jurisdictional boundaries. As investigators, you can't either. Uh, it's critical to be able to network and utilize a regional approach uh, when investigating crime gun violence. Uh, and information systems uh, available to law enforcement uh, to be able to uh, reach across the uh, jurisdictional boundaries. Uh, I thank you for your attention and, and attending the uh, webinar today and turn it over to you, Aaron. Sure, thank you all very much. Really great job presenting. Uh, we have received a number of questions already and uh, you know, if folks wanna keep on submitting them, we'll get through as many as we can. Ed, um, I am going to uh, send you the first couple of questions here because I know that that your time is uh, that you have to drop off right at the top of the hour. Uh, so for you, Ed, um, do you have any suggestions on how to manage the complexity of the case, especially when you have multiple agencies, technology constantly coming in? Are some best practices that you can share with the audience? Some of the uh, some of the key things we do. Um, first of all, documentation is 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 what phone came from where is is so important. And I know it sounds very basic, um, but really having an out a, a plan from the start, good documentation on who gave you a device, uh, where it came from. You know, especially you get juris multi jurisdictions or various jurisdictions that show up. Maybe they had a series of mass arrests. They have five, six, eight devices, and they're trying to dump them all off on you. Um, really starting with that. Um, is what we found is key. We actually start diagramming by hand early. Um, there's a couple different uh, free tools out there, at least for the diagramming part. Um, we'll put maybe a victim, something in the center, a key focus, a victim, a business, um, and then we actually start uh, drawing lines off of that. Um, there's this tool called uh, Maltego, which is used in malware investigation, but it's you can just draw with it and drop in evidence uh, with or evidence photos along with a name um, and put some notes in there. And really we found that's kind of key of keeping track of who's a victim, who, how people are connected um, until we get enough data to really start um, combining it in a analytics format. 
great. Thank you so much. And uh, actually, I've got someone here who, who wanted to say hey from Frankfurt, Germany, from Stefan. Uh, so I'm assuming that you know who that ends up being. Yes, uh, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and another question for you. Uh, did you get all the information using the Celebrite Analytics Enterprise? Is that Was that what you ended up using? Or? Yes. Um, that's what we use to combine everything together. Um, we have uh, access to multiple um, mobile forensic suites here um, in the lab, um, uh, Celebrite Oxygen, uh, XRY. Um, Celebrite's our primary tool, um, but that was the only analytics tool that 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 is. I don't want to say that's available, but that's the only one that met our needs um, by far more than the other tools. Um, that was definitely key in being able to ingest any type of image or data. Um, Got it. And, and and that's really what what helped solve it for us. And then is it is it used by all of your special teams and investigative units? Uh, and do the patrol units ever use the technologies? Yes, actually, well, our patrol officers are trained as part of their orientation to come in. And uh, they're trained how to seize di digital devices, um, what devices to turn off, to, uh, that they have to leave on, what ones they need to bring to us directly. Um, they have to, all the digital exams extractions have to come through the lab. Um, and we have a couple special detectives that are trained as well to aid us in, uh, in their cases. Um, the majority of it's our detectives and specialized units, but we probably get, say, probably 30% of our, our intake cases are from various patrol units as well. Great. And then finally, could you talk a little bit about the specifics of the search warrants uh, on the phones that were collected? Um, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Uh, the, I mean, I mean, I'm they, guessing, they, I'm guessing they were maybe, search warrants. got it. Okay. Well, I, I would ask the person who asked that question, if you could provide a little bit more information about what aspect of the search warrant um, that you would be interested in. Uh, we did just receive another question. Uh, how prob what? problematic was it in terms of getting through the security on the phone, passwords and encrypted phones and so on? Uh, obviously, as we progressed later in the investigation, things became a little more problematic. Uh, we have things like, you know, Android encryption. Android 7 was released, um, and they were stealing phones so they could have the latest and greatest phones. That caused some issues. Um, a lot of them loved, I'll be honest with you, they loved Apple iPhones. Um, and I would say probably at least two-thirds of them either were social engineered or cooperative in giving their passcodes up. Um, our gang unit did a phenomenal job of just building a rapport with them, and they'd show up with eight phones and eight passcodes, which is just, you know, obviously, you know, we want to take care of them and 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 get those and get those in. Um, some of the other technologies we used, um, if they had a lot of them are low income areas, they didn't really have computers at home to get any type of advanced pairing record or anything from. Um, so if they weren't cooperative, uh, we, we used an uh, investigative process. We used a search warrant to Apple to get their iCloud account, um, and we got we got a lot of a lot of data that way. Um, as for the as some of the encrypted Androids, the ones that we really wanted into, um, there was one or two I believe we sent to Celebrate Services, um, and I believe the other three that really gave us a hard time. Um, we either eventually got the passcode or the technology improved, and we might have gotten it within a week or a month, but within a few months, you know, through updates, the technology improved, and we were, we were able to get uh, access that uh, information. But by far, um, the best success we had was from uh, detect the investigators obtaining the passcodes. Got it. Great. That's that's really great advice. And so for any other presenters, have have you all noticed an increase of tradecraft in regards to phones, such as using all burner phones, switching out the SIM cards, turning the phones off during the crimes, uh, surveillance phones, GPS, and so on? I'm wondering if there's a trend in a tradecraft of street games that are similar to some of the terror cells. So it's a big question. <laughs> and feel free, anyone who wants to jump in and answer that one. Ed, maybe if if you wanted to provide some insight, if if you've seen any kind of changes in the techniques or more sophistication. This is Shannon. Um, one of the things that we have seen is um, with the drug operation type things, 
is when you get a subject in custody and they have a really hot number, they will say over jail calls to have that number ported to a new phone or a new uh, provider so that they can continue to receive the customers on that number. So we have been seeing that quite a bit um, on our end here in Milwaukee. Interesting. That's that's great to know. I, and actually, I did have another question for you, Shannon. Um, you talked about the, the different technologies that your agency has procured. Did you have the same funding source for that technology, or or uh, what? How did you fund the procurement? Is really what the question is getting at. Uh, the procurement for the Nibin program. For Nibin, and then for Shotspotter and Celebrate. Okay, if I understand. so um, I only know about the ShotSpotter and Nibin because I was actually hired in 2014. So I know that we partnered with the ATF to actually get that free from them. So they actually helped us set that up um, here at our department within our fusion center. And then regarding the ShotSpotter, um, our previous captain, our two previous captains, had wrote a grant to actually get funding for that to start out ShotSpotter. And then as the more success we've got, we just extended it to get more money and funding to extend the boundaries of our ShotSpotter location. Got it. Great. Thank you very much for that. Okay, uh, we've got a couple of questions um, for you, Trevor. Could you talk, uh, you talked a little bit about the tolls. Could you talk a little bit how tolls work with phones? So basically, the uh, in the investigation that we had, the cell phones ping off of cell phone towers, and that puts you into a vicinity of those towers. Well, in the valley here, there's a lot of cell phone towers because we're a major, um, a big city. So the, the tower records were showing where those phones were for the suspects in these cases, which are placing them within very close proximity of of the cases. So, and for for instance, the first homicide that we know happened, the cell phone tolls put um, the main suspect that I had his picture up there within a block and a half of that first homicide. And I believe it was about 15 minutes before the actual murder happened. So that's how we use the tolls for uh, that investigation. Got it. Great. Thank you very much. And then uh, you you mentioned during your presentation about finding the presence of DNA on one of the firearms. Do you check all handguns for DNA? And if so, which parts of the firearm do you check for DNA? So I think there's a real big misconception out there about the success rate of getting fingerprints and DNA off of firearms. Um, and I read a study, and I can't remember where it was from, but it, it, I know it was on Police One somewhere, for those of you guys who are on there. But the study was talking about less than 5% of all guns that are fingerprinted, you you get APHIS quality fingerprints from that gun. So I definitely don't, I'm not the fingerprinter. We have forensic te technicians that do that. DNA, we are more successful getting DNA off of guns um, from the trigger guard, from the magazine wells. Um, the bullets are actually in the magazine. That's where we get our greatest successes. There's more fingerprints found on magazines than there are the actual guns, especially when you have polymer guns like locks uh, that just don't have a surface that really um, lend themselves to being great surfaces for for gunpowder and for, or I'm sorry, for fingerprint powder and for uh, uh, DNA swabs. So the trigger guard is probably the biggest area and then the magazine and the bullets, if you have that in the gun, are going to be the best success rates that I've seen as far as getting that evidence off of the gun. Long guns, different story. Got it. Great. Thank you. And then I've got another question for you, if you don't mind. Uh, what software do you use for obtaining and interpreting the cell phone toll data? So I am more of a case-carrying detective, like the guy who's going to go out and find the bad guys. And then I give those phones to um, detectives who work in, in that area. And I believe they use Cellbrite. Um, I am not tech savvy as far as the cell phones go. I understand how the technology works and what they need to use it and how to write search warrants to get it. But once I actually get those warrants, I hand it off to a specialist. And it kind of sounds like Ed was, was one of those guys who's, who's really uh, up to speed on that kind of stuff. So I'm more of a uh, go find the shooter. And then when you have that kind of fun evidence, give it over to somebody a lot smarter than me to, to process. Got it. 
That makes a lot of sense. Uh, so we have time for just a couple of other questions, but I think they're good ones, and I think any of you might be able to respond to them. So when taking cases to trial um, for a case that has used this technology, how much work needs to be done to exp explain the underlying technology to the juries? I think it's important to not overstep your ground. So, for instance, in 2007, I know we had a um, an officer who was murdered uh, here in Glendale. He was murdered in the area that Shot Spotter covers, and there were some questions about how Shot Spotter works, how the um, towers receive information. So, I believe the uh, the path for that was to have people from that company come in and explain how that works. So, I think it's always important when you're testifying not to testify to stuff you don't truly under understand so a lot of us in law enforcement you you get how to work a system but you don't get how the system works if that makes sense so it's important not to talk like you're an expert when you're not because that's how a defense attorney is really going to open up and hammer you and a great example of that is i think probably most of us listening and most cops understand what dna is but to truly understand how dna is translated is probably something you should leave to um, a scientist who understands the science behind it and not the cop version of, well, I know your DNA is on that gun because you touched it, if that makes sense. Yep. No, that was really good. And Thank you Aaron, very much. Aaron, this is Jim. May I also add that um, in in situ situations like that, ShotSpotter does have um, uh, expert personnel to available uh, to assist in uh, testimony uh, for the, the technical side of their product. Got it. Great. And Jim, you're uh, actually, this next question is probably dr uh, best directed to you, but obviously no one else who can provide insight. Uh, does NIBIN and IBIS provide information about other agencies that may have matching casings? Yes. Uh, that that is um, what is you know so important about the uh, IBIS equipment and the NIBIN network. NIBIN allows you to network um, nationwide. So there's right now we're approaching over 200 sites uh, in the country, and not only are there 200 sites, but there are multiple agencies utilizing those sites. So. Um, Law enforcement agencies, you know, can connect, network with each other, and you know, sh they they were they're automatically sharing information uh, across you know jurisdictional borders. Great, thanks so much, and I really want to uh, thank uh, you, Jim, uh, all of our all of our sponsoring organizations, Shannon, Trevor, Ed. Thank you guys so much for sharing your expertise today. Thank you to our audience um, for participating in today's Justice Clearinghouse webinar. And with that, this concludes today's webinar. Have a great day, everyone, and please stay safe. Bye now.